praise you for your grace, your unconditional love, the gift of your forgiveness. We praise you, Lord, that you are a God that took it all for us, went to the cross for us, for the salvation of the world. You love us and you cherish us and want the very best for us. So we praise you, Lord, that we are here to worship you. We are here to hear your word. May it take root in our lives. May we be renewed and changed because we have met you here today. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> so I want to tell you a story about, okay, you see Ann Miller over here at the end? Ann Miller and John Miller, her husband, is working the, the board today, and I want to tell you the story about them. They've been members here forever, right? Forever. Okay. And I want to tell you a story about them, because they've you know, been on this amazing faith journey. Well, they were working here at church, and were very busy here, and they came in separate cars, and so now they're driving along Portion Road, and Ann's behind John, okay? And, um, and they were in a hurry, you know, they've been very busy today, uh, uh, this particular day, and so John stops, though, at a yellow light. He just stops the car and yells, no, I wouldn't blame him, you know, because they have the cameras all out there now. Yes, but Anne's in the car behind him, and Anne is just shaking her hands, and she can't hit the steering wheel. She can't believe he stopped for the yellow light, and she's honking the horn, and, and she just can't believe that. He just didn't go through the yellow light so she can go, because they were in a hurry. And so, you know, she, she just kept screaming and carrying on, and so then all of a sudden there was a tap on Anne's window, and it was the Suffolk County police officer. And he tapped on your window, and, uh, and she looked at him, and he was very serious. And um, she rolled down the window, and he ordered her out of the car. And so um, she was in full view of everybody on the street. It was very embarrassing for Anne, and he handcuffed her, took her to the precinct, and she was searched, and she was fingerprinted, and she was photographed, and thrown into the holding cell. Okay, yeah. And after several hours, a police officer approached the holding cell, and he escorted her to the booking desk. And there at the booking desk was the arresting officer. And he was waiting there for her, and he had her personal effects in a bag. And he, he handed them to her, and he began to say to her, I'm very sorry uh, for the mistake. You see, I was behind your car, and I saw, you know, you were blowing your horn, and you were raising your hands feverishly, and just carrying on, and you were hitting the steering wheel, and you were, you know, and I think you were cussing, but I'm not even sure. I couldn't hear what you were saying, but you were carrying on. And then I noticed on the back of the car, there was uh, the gold Christian um, fish with a little cross on it, and there was a, what would you, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Sticker on her bumper of her car and, and a keep Christ and Christmas magnet on the bumper as well. And, and even the license plate had the, you know, the frame that says, I follow Jesus. So, you know, um, he said, so naturally, by what I saw on your car, what I saw going on in the car, I assumed it was stolen. <laughs> Yes, the church is full of hypocrites. <laughs> when we become Christians, we don't stop being sinners. The church, by definition, is a place for hypocrites. It's a place for the repeat offenders, for the sinners, right? The church is full of people like you and me who sometimes aren't a pretty sight as Christians. We're yelling at our children. We're losing our patience at the grocery store. We get caught in lies, little white lies, of course, we call them, but we get caught in lies. We're rude to our co-workers, we gossip, we speak meanly about other people. We put the worst construction on 
on what people do and say rather than being gracious and understanding uh, what they do and say. We put the worst construction on it. We're often negative. We're often unthankful, ungrateful, self-serving, self-centered. And for some of us, we're cool and we're callous and we're dismissive of others. Yes, we're sinners, right? We're sinners. And the church, the church is the hospital for sinners. So I want you to turn to the other person, to the person next to you or near you, and say, you hypocrite. You hypocrite. You hypocrite. You hypocrite. Now, now I want you to turn to the persons and people around you and say, I am a great sinner, but I have a great God. I'm a great sinner, but I have a great God. I'm a great sinner, but I have a great God. Right? That's the truth. Well, the self-righteous, holier-than-thou crowd of religious leaders and the Pharisees um, that were getting ready to stone the woman caught in adultery forgot this reality, that we're great sinners, but we have a great God. They were hypocrites, but they were to find out differently from, from Jesus. Jesus said, let anyone, let anyone who is without sin cast the first stone. Throw that stone. Go ahead. Throw that stone. But when the hypocrites, the religious leaders, the accusers, the sinners, <laughs> heard this, heard what Jesus said, one by one, think about it, one by one, they dropped their stones. They just dropped their stones and hit the ground. And they walked or slipped or slithered away. Quietly. Well, maybe their sin wasn't, uh, sins weren't as bad as, or ugly or yucky or mucky as the, uh, the woman caught in adultery. I mean, adultery was pretty bad back then, and you got stoned to death for it. But they committed sins, and they were sinners. You see, God doesn't categorize sin. He doesn't say there are some bad sins and some really bad sins and less bad sins and outrageously bad sins and horrible sins. No, so bad sins. Sin is sin. The men in the crowd turned away because of their guilt. They turned away and dropped their stones, and their mouths were silenced because of their guilt before their God. And yet the one who was the guilty one, the one in their midst, was left standing there, alone with Jesus as they walked away. She didn't say a word. She made no excuses for her behavior. She just waits for Jesus to speak. She waits for her, for his condemnation, for his verdict of guilty. But then here comes the most beautiful part of the story, the most loving and tender and kind part of the story. Jesus says, where, woman, where are your accusers? Nobody will accuse you. No one will condemn you. No, Lord. And he says, well, neither will I. Go and sin no more. The woman recognized him as Lord. As Lord. As someone powerful. <coughs> and significant savior for her life. She said, no, Lord. And then Jesus says, 
He doesn't, well, they say it this way. He doesn't say, go and sin no more, and I won't condemn you. He says, I won't condemn you. Go and sin no more. He treats her with dignity. He treats this woman with compassion. He treats this woman um, with love. And there is total honesty going on here, recognizing her sin. And there is love. Here is the Savior of the world, offering grace, offering his unconditional love, offering forgiveness for her sin. And then he sends her out to begin a whole new life. Go and sin no more. Go and sin no more. In other words, turn away from your sin. Lead a holy life. Turn away from the world, the world's values. Turn to, turn to the kingdom values. Turn from your sinning ways. Turn to God. Go and sin no more. Now, Jesus understands that we cannot not sin. We are sinners. But what he is saying is that we can have a changed life. If we are stealing from a store, then we stop stealing from the store. Once we, you know, we talk to God, we, we confess our sin, we, we, um, we repent, we turn away from that sin, we ask God to help us to not continue the sin. So what he's asking us to do is to go and sin no more, to struggle and strain and work toward living a holy and righteous and right life, a God-honoring ways. Jesus forgave her and sent her out with a new life to start, a new way of living. Essentially, what he is saying is, you have sinned, but there's more to you. There's more to your life than your sin. You and I have sinned, but there's more to your life. There's your, more to you and me than our sin. Even though she was guilty and caught in the act of adultery, by God's grace, she leaves with a clean slate and a new power within. Most of us are not adulterers. But we have gone down some pretty dark and dingy roadways, haven't we? Some pretty ugly pathways in our lives. We lie to our spouse. We drown our sorrows or woe is me's in alcohol, drugs, overeating, overspending. We've taken liberties with the truth. We've abused coworkers. We've stepped over the marginalized, we, you know, um, uh, carry tales, we gossip, we whisper behind other people's backs. We are like the woman <coughs> caught in adultery, truly guilty in the eyes of a holy God. Truly guilty. But grace Grace says, I have forgiven you. Now let me, let me also change your life. God is saying, I have forgiven you. I love you unconditionally. You don't deserve it, but I'm giving it to you anyway because it's a gift from me to you. You don't deserve it. You don't earn it. I am giving you the gift of my grace, my unconditional love. And now let me change your heart. You see, we can't do it on our own. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. We need God within us. God answers the mess of our lives with grace. Grace is God's best idea because grace comes to us because of his son's death and resurrection. 
because he spilled his blood on the cross for you and me. God's best idea is his salvation plan because he wants to pour out his grace on us. He wants to pour out his unconditional love on us. He wants to cover you and me with his love. He wants to rescue us. And he wants to restore us to a relationship with him. From Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace you are saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is a gift from God. We are not saved by our works, lest anyone should boast. Central to our faith is the, are these two verses. It is by grace. It is by grace. It is by grace. It is by God's grace that we are saved. Through our believing in God's grace and who God is. And so it's by grace, through faith. It's not our doing. We don't do it. It's a free gift from God. We don't earn our salvation. We don't have a pile of stuff that's good enough that's going to earn our way to salvation, to God's heavenly kingdom. For by grace, God's gift, you have been saved. Through our faith, it is a gift from God. You are not saved by your works, because then we might boast about it. We might boast about our good works. It is God's gift. Grace is God's unconditional, unmerited, undeserved, unearned forgiveness and love. How amazing is that? Grace is about God as the heart surgeon that cracks open the chest, that takes out our poisoned heart and replaces it. Removing the poisoned heart and replacing it with his own heart. From uh, Exodus chapter 36, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. You see, God creates the change. Because of his love poured out on us, he creates the change in us. When grace happens, Christ enters. Christ moves in to our hearts. And so we don't clean up our own act. God does the work in us. And it's out of his deep, abiding, precious love for you and me that we do not get what we deserve, but we get his love and his grace and his presence in our living.
Lord, we come to you this day and we are rejoicing because we are in awe, amazed by your grace, your unconditional love. A love that went to the cross with arms open wide to redeem us, to heal us, to restore us. Heavenly Father, you love us with an everlasting love and we give you thanks and praise that even as sinners, you do not turn your back on us. But you desire, you desire for us to come to you, to know your great love, to know your unconditional love, to know your unmerited love, a love we do not deserve, the gift of forgiveness that we do not deserve, that you just poured out upon us. We are awestruck, Lord, and we thank you. Help us to to live better, honoring you, to live in ways that we are able to turn our back on what the world values and turn our face to what you value. Heavenly Father, as we come to you this day, we come to ask for your presence to be upon those who are ill and hospitalized, who are in need of your healing touch. We ask that you be with with uh, Grandpa Jerry in his last days, uh, with Florence Truman, uh, Eleanor Truman, 